Yes, Lord, we pray, feed us from your holy word. Feed us from these truths unchanged. That, Lord, as we're fed today, we would take these words, these truths, and that they would indeed echo through eternity as your truth proclaimed in our lives today. Lord, make your word alive and active to us, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please do uh, take a seat. Well, if you've uh, been with us over recent weeks, you'll know that we've been on something of a journey as a church for three weeks, thinking about what it looks like uh, to live different, or perhaps to put it a different way, to live the set-apart life, which is how the Apostle Paul refers to it in Scripture, to be set apart. In fact, it's something of a a favourite theme of his. Do you remember way back at the beginning of September, the sun was still shining and we were all turning up in shorts? Uh, In a sense, our flight took off as we unpack Romans chapter 7, where the Apostle Paul, who writes the letter to the Romans, describes the problem that we as humanity face. Do you remember it? The do-do verse. The do-do verse. Romans 7, 15, the good I want to do, I don't do. The evil I don't want to do, I do-do. There's the do-do. And that's how our series took off, in a sense, defining the problem. And we discovered, look, the problem for us as humanity is our wrestle with our sinful natures. It's the wrestle that we have with those bits of us that would seek to rebel against the perfect will of God in our lives. That was our takeoff. And then we spent a couple of weeks, didn't we, in mid-flight without too much turbulence and with no refreshments as we opened up the various themes of of Romans chapter 8. If Romans chapter 7 defined the problem, then Romans chapter 8 unpacked the solution over two weeks. Didn't we hear some good news? That God has done something about the problem of our sin. God doesn't just identify that there's a problem, Romans chapter 7, but he goes on Romans chapter 8 to actually do something about that problem. And as we discovered last weekend, as a consequence, if we trust in Jesus, we can become children of God. We can cry out the most intimate name to God that there is, which is Daddy. We can call him Daddy. But more than that, Paul went on to say, we become co-heirs with Christ. We are adopted into the most incredible inheritance for the rest of eternity. One of my favorite scripture verses in the whole of scripture, Romans 8, verse 1, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is good news. No condemnation. As we've discovered over these last three weeks, we'll discover a bit more today. As Christians, we can live without guilt, without shame, and without remorse, which can be so debilitating. Why? Because God has done something about those things. We were thinking, weren't we, that Satan's greatest delight would be for you and I to get stuck in a place where those things actually define who we are. Our guilt, our remorse, our sense of shame. But Jesus came to die for you, and as Jesus died for you, you are completely forgiven from all of those things that you wrestle with. So I wonder, what can we say this morning with absolute confidence? Well, we can say this, any condemning feelings that you might have towards yourself today are not from God. You might feel a sense of conviction as we worship together today, but if you're feeling any sense of condemnation, then those feelings do not come from God. God's greatest desire for you is that you would be free, that you would move forward in your relationship with him as you seek to find his plans and his purposes for your life. Our God longs for us to live what we might call the unchained life. God wants us to experience freedom daily, fully, completely, which is exactly the message that the Apostle Paul ended Romans chapter 8 with, as we were thinking about last weekend. Those incredible words, we're not just conquerors, he says, we're more than conquerors if we're in Christ Jesus. He says, for I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in the whole of creation, he says, will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul's great desire for the church in Rome, and in a sense I would say to us today, God's great desire for us as his children today, is that we would understand the depth of how much God loves us. Now some of us know that already intellectually. We can say, yeah, I know I'm loved by God, but actually we've never experienced that love personally. And there is a world of difference between knowing something in your head and really deeply knowing it in the depths of your heart. 
So Romans chapter 7 describes the problem. Romans chapter 8 describes the solution. Now we're going to skip over them today, but chapters 9, 10 and 11 of Romans then go on to develop this theme, this idea that this good news is not just for God's chosen people, the Jews, but it's for all people. And then we get to Romans chapter 12, verse 1, where we discover our third therefore in this series. Romans chapter 12, to go back to my plane analogy, is where our plane lands today. And it's where Paul, having identified the problem in Romans 7, offered the solution in Romans chapter 8, deals with what we might call the the so what question. The so what question. What do we do with all this truth that we've known? His point today is to bring some application. If you've got a Bible, uh, chapter 12 uh, of Romans, I'm going to read just two verses. It says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and your proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then, he says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. So for 11 chapters in this letter to the Romans, using all sorts of really complicated theology and difficult doctrinal themes and words, Paul has been speaking about God's abundant grace in Jesus. He's been describing for 11 chapters God's amazing story of relentless grace. That's what it is. God tells a story of relentless grace, a grace that continues to pursue us even when God's people have been expressing what we might call reluctant faith. Can you identify with that? Is your faith ever reluctant? Is it sometimes reluctant or resistant or maybe even redundant when it should be rejuvenated and rejoicing? You've no idea how long I spent in a thesaurus for that. But would you know this morning that God's grace is for you? God's grace for you is relentless, it's persistent, it's non-stop, it is continuous. There's a sense that Paul has been building up his theological argument and it's been growing and it's been growing ever since chapter 1. And as he starts to write the words of chapter 12, it's almost like this is a great crescendo in all that he's trying to say. If he was writing a musical piece, this would be the moment where the music goes really loud and and dramatic. In a sense, the very first word of chapter 12 becomes the the loudest point in his message. Chapter 1, chapter 2, building, building, building. And he goes right the way through uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11. There was a bit of a high point in chapter 8 as we were thinking about. And then he gets to chapter 12, and there's this loud, therefore, with the sound of trumpets and rolling drums and all sorts of amazing stuff as he says, therefore. Paul's therefore at the beginning of chapter 12 is an attention-grabbing therefore. It should grab your attention. Now, as all you English purists know, therefore is a conjunctive adverb, an essential bridge over which you have to travel so that what's about to be said makes sense in the light of all that's been said before. Okay, I said that for the English purists. (laughs) But in short, Paul's great cry in verses 1 and 2 is a cry which is simply saying, would you surrender? Surrender. In the light of all that I've said already about humankind's problem in chapters 1 to 7, in the light of all that I've said already about God's faithful solution in chapters 8 to 11, therefore, chapter 12, would you offer your bodies as a living sacrifice to God? Therefore, surrender. Now, oftentimes when I think about the word surrender, I think of surrender being a very weak and kind of defeatist act. Even as I say, would you surrender? It's probably conjuring up in your mind the the image of an overpowered army waving a white flag of surrender because they've been defeated or maybe the image of a a boxer whose coach is chucking in the towel because their fighter is completely finished. But as Paul makes this call here at the very beginning of Romans chapter 12, he's not describing surrender as being a negative thing. In fact, it's quite the opposite. As Paul is calling us to surrender, he's saying surrender is powerful. Surrender is power-filled. Surrender is the ultimate sign of spiritual strength. It's not a weakness. He says that the very act of surrender is the greatest possible expression of our worship. When we surrender, we're able to properly and fully worship God. Surrender continually declares that we're done with doing life in our own strength. And instead it's saying, God, I need you. I need you to walk this journey of faith with me. Surrender uh, is an act of worship 
in the economy of God. Now we know, don't we, and I know I'm speaking to the converted, that worship is not just about singing songs within the context of a one hour, 15 minute event on a Sunday morning. Although how often do we narrowly define worship as being that? We know that worship is about something so, so much more. What you'll notice in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, is Paul does not say, in view of God's mercy, I urge you to worship God by rocking up at church on a Sunday morning and to sing some songs as your spiritual act of worship. Do you know the call to worship is way more demanding than singing some songs? Now, don't misunderstand me here. I'm not for a moment suggesting that the singing of songs, which we've done this morning, is not an act of worship. It's an essential part of my own worship experience, and I I love it. But it's not the only way, and dare I say, the most important way that we can offer our worship to God. God's call is much greater, it's much higher, it's much harder, and it's much deeper than such a narrow definition. Worship is a 24-7 lifestyle. It's a dedication of the whole of our lives to God. Every minute, every breath, every word, every thought, every action. The passage begins here with the phrase, therefore, and then Paul goes on to say, I urge you. Can you see how important Paul feels this whole theme is? He's saying, I urge you. There's a great weight in what I'm saying here. I urge you in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy, that's going to set the stage for everything that he says afterwards. I urge you to offer worship-filled surrender as you recognize the boundless mercy and grace that God has shown to you. I urge you in view of God's mercy. In a sense, Paul is saying here, it's all about understanding that we were once were lost in sin, but God in his great love has provided a way for us to be reconciled with him by the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. I urge you, in view of God's mercy, to make a response. Kay shared this a few weeks back, but I I really love it. The way that Eugene Peterson paraphrases verse 1 of chapter 12 of Romans in the message. He says, take your everyday, your ordinary life, you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work, and you're walking around life, all those ordinary things, and place that ordinary life before God as an offering. You see, true worship happens when we live a life of sacrifice, when we we live a life which is an ordinary life of worship. Surrender is not a one-time event, but it's an, an intentional decision to offer the whole of ourselves entirely to God. Surrender involves a radical change of the way we think and of the way we live. Paul says this is what delights God most. And in view of all that he's already said in chapters 1 to 11 about the problem and the solution to sin, surely he's saying here, surely surrender and sacrifice before God is the only right and proper response to such a God. Paul's appeal to the church is that worship is meant to be a sacrificial offering. Well, what do we sacrifice? We sacrifice every part, our time, our talents, Our resources, our relationships, our gifts, our everything. told you it was much harder than just singing some songs. Do you know as a church leader, there's probably one area where I have to invest more of my ministry time than any other place. And it's what I've come to call functional spiritual compartmentalization. You try saying that at 12 o'clock. Functional spiritual compartmentalization. It's this idea that many of us have bought into that there's spiritual bits of my life and then there's those other bits of my life. The idea that God is interested in this bit and this bit, but he's not that interested in these other bits. Now, you'll know exactly what this looks like in your own life because of your everyday experience of life. When you get home later, I encourage you to take a look in your drawers. (laughs) I mean the kitchen bedroom drawers, not what you're thinking. See, what you'll discover is places where you've neatly stored cutlery and clothes and staplers and pens and all the other stuff of life. Spiritual compartmentalization is when, whether we realize it or not, we've divided our life normally into two nice, neat, tidy drawers. There's real life and then there's spiritual life. Now, the real life drawer is the one that we dig into probably most frequency, with the greatest frequency. It's it's the one we're most comfortable with. Our real life drawer is the one that contains the everyday everyday stuff of life, like our jobs and our physical health, our family, our friends, our, our social pursuits, our possessions, our daily routines. 
This is the draw that actually dominates our thinking and our doing most of the time. It's where we expend most of our emotional and our physical energy, and it's where most of our dreams are realised but sometimes too dashed. Now the temptation is to think if we've done this in life, is that actually God is not that interested in this real life draw, but the reality is that he is. Some of us may have even fooled ourselves into thinking that God doesn't even know this draw exists, but of course he does. Do you know what I mean? And then maybe for some of us, we have what we might refer to as this second draw, the other draw, the, the spiritual life draw. Now into this draw, we put all of our God stuff. It's the draw for Sunday worship, for Bible study, for faith-based courses, for prayer, for our tithes, our offerings, for those short-term mission trips we go on. It's the draw where we file away our evangelistic conversations with neighbours or with extended family members. And you know, here's the thing, you can operate a two-draw system, and yes, you can still believe in Jesus and the forgiveness and the eternity that's to come, but if you're operating a two-draw system, it's very likely that your beliefs are not having a radical impact on the way that you're living your everyday life. Why would they? They're being kept in two completely separate drawers. When we live like this, our faith is undoubtedly an aspect of our faith, but it's not something that shapes every single part of our lives. We won't be what Paul describes as being set apart. Now I wonder, do you live with one drawer or do you live with two? I wonder if as I'm describing this picture of this two-drawer system, whether I'm describing you this morning. Do you know, I really wish that I could say that the Chris Brockway life is only made of one drawer. But it's not. I have to fight this constantly of living against this two-drawer system. Why? Because I've got a doo-doo problem, and I suspect you've got a doo-doo problem too. But in the biblical narrative, in this worldview of Jesus, our life only has one drawer, and it's called the gospel in everyday life. Everything gets piled into the one drawer. And in a sense, that's the very heart of Paul's message to the church in Rome. Listen again to what he says, and I'll build it into verse 2 as well. He says, take your every day, your ordinary life, place it before God as an offering. <coughs> Embracing what God does for you is the very best thing that you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without even thinking. You see, our God is a God who has this radical, single draw purpose for our lives. He's interested in every single part of our lives. And that's why in verse 1 and verse 2, he talks about our bodies, and he's interested in our bodies and what we do with them, but he's also interested in our minds. And Paul is saying, would you let your mind be transformed? Uh, would you be transformed by the renewing of your mind? Then and only then will you know God's perfect and his good will. Only then will you be living a life of surrender where you can experience God in all of his fullness, that abundant life. As I draw to a close, I want to leave us with a challenge of application as we wrestle with this so what question that Paul has been asking. We know about the problem. Yes, we do. It's called sin. We know in our heads and some of us know in our hearts as well that God has done something about the problem and he's given us Jesus. Romans chapter 8, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nothing will ever separate you from the love of Christ, which is in, uh, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You are a child of God, you can call him daddy. You are a co-heir with an incredible inheritance. You're not just a conqueror, you are more than a conqueror if you are in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 12, so what? In view of God's mercy, I urge you to live a life of surrender. One draw or two draws. God is interested in the whole of our lives. And as I finish, I'm going to pray just a really simple prayer. It's not my prayer. It's a prayer that belongs to uh, Richard Foster from his amazing book. And I'm going to pray this prayer over us. And as I pray, I want to just simply invite you this morning to wrestle with a question. Lord, is there one area? Is there one area of my life where actually I'm struggling to let you in? In view of God's amazing mercy, I urge you to surrender that thing to God.
Let's be still together. Just a moment just to allow God by his spirit maybe just to bring to your mind one area, a couple of areas where you need to surrender. You just need to say yes to Jesus and I'm going to pray this prayer. hold those thoughts in your mind today O oh Lord I yield myself to you may your will be my delight today may you have perfect sway in me may your love be the pattern of my living I surrender to you my hopes my dreams my ambitions. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. I place into your loving care my family, my friends, my future. Care for them with a care that I can never give. I release into your hands my need to control my craving for status, my fear of obscurity. Lord, would you eradicate the evil, purify the good, and establish your kingdom here on earth. For Jesus' sake and for his glory, we all pray and say together, Amen.